What does a good shepherd do? That's what we're going to find out today in John 10. I have said before, I don't love the sheep analogies, but the more I read the Gospels, the more we've gone through, I understand the sheep analogies better. Sheep being frightened, sheep being lured away by food and then finding itself in the midst of wolves. We wander away. We have low attention spans. We're frightened all the time. Sheep can be very willful too. I was in England hiking. It was my goal to be able to pet one of the sheep. I just would go into every field. Like, come here, come here, I want to pet them. Sheep just have nothing of it. My friend would just laugh at me. But petting people's sheep starts out saying, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in through another way, that man's a thief and a robber. Thief and a robber, are they the same thing? Anyway, he wants you to come through the front door. Jesus is saying, There is a way to come into the kingdom of God, and you should come in through that way. You will hear the shepherd's voice. The sheep know his shepherd. And I know all my sheep by name, and I lead them out, and they know his voice. A stranger will not follow, but flee from him. See, that was why the sheep were fleeing from me, because I'm a stranger. They don't know me. They don't know the voice of the stranger. Jesus is trying to get them to understand what he's saying. Truly, truly, I am the door of the sheep. That's how the sheep are supposed to come in. But there were people who came before me, and they weren't accurate. They were thieves and robbers. They were stealing my sheep away from me, luring them away. And the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. Now we have another I am. He is the gate, he is the door, he is the light, he is the bread, he is the water, all the things. Anyone who enters by him will be saved and go in and out of the pasture. And the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came so you would have life and have it more abundantly. You know, people, I think, think of Christianity as this very limiting thing. Oh, you're only having this subsection of life. Because you're not sinning. You're not going to the websites you shouldn't be going to. You're not having the activities that other people will have. Your life is so small and limited. But instead, Jesus says, no, that's actually not true. You're going to have life and you're going to have it more abundantly. Lays down his life for the sheep. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to lay down his life for us. But a man, a hired hand, he's not the good shepherd. He's just someone who gets paid. Because if there's some danger coming, in this case, the wolf, the hired hand's just going to leave and the wolf will grab the sheep and the sheep will scatter, which is even dumber because if you were to scatter, the other wolves that are out in the field will get you too. You know, if it's like us that when we are feeling threatened, we're feeling scared, we scatter and then we're alone. We're, we're ready to be victimized by all the other wolves out there because we run instead of running to the good shepherd. But he's a good shepherd. He knows his own. We know him. The father knows him. He knows his father. And he will lay down his life for his sheep. There's other sheep, but they're not part of this group. I must bring them to. It's it's the, the Gentiles, the other nations, the group of people. But I also think for the Jews who are honestly seeking God, they're going to find Jesus as well. And you know what? He's going to lay down his life so that he can take it back up to him. No one takes it from him, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I'm going to take it back up again. All this that Jesus is about to do and has done that we read in all the other gospels is his authority to do. People were involved in it. Judas was involved in it. Pontius Pilate's involved in it. But in the end, he is the one laying it down. And it says this charge this mission I have been given by my father. This is why whenever we get into these wars about who killed Jesus, it's ridiculous. We all killed Jesus because of the sin in the world, which we are a part of. But then the other sense, nobody killed Jesus. He is giving authority to have his life taken. So don't get into fights with who killed Jesus. And again, people are like, 
is he possessed by demons? And they're saying, well, he can't. You know, same thing that the blind man was saying. A demon can't do that. Demons don't heal people. They don't create miracles of God. So in that sense, people were realizing that they were understanding what happened and what is going on. He goes on to the Feast of Dedication that took place in Jerusalem. This is going to be Hanukkah. It was winter, and Jesus was walking into the temple near the colonnades, the columns of Solomon. And all of that was taken down in 70 AD, which is why we don't have the structure of the building like we did then. Jews gathered to him and says, just tell us, are you the Messiah? Are you not the Messiah? Quit telling us all these parables and telling us these stories and giving us these examples. And Jesus is like, you know what? I told you these things. The work I do is in my Father's name. That's going to be the guy you worship, Jesus the Father, and he bears witness to me. And you don't believe. And I told you before, you don't believe. You're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I give them eternal life. My Father has given them to me and it's greater than all. No one can take them away from me because I and the Father are one. Wow. Picked up stones. They were going to stone him and throw him. And he says, you know what? I've shown you all these good things, these good works, and now you're going to stone me? Miracles. You know, you've seen in the other synoptic gospels where they were like, well, give us a sign. And, you know, Jesus is like, I've given you many signs and you didn't pay attention to those either. And then they say, well, we're not stoning you because of all the good works you did. We're stoning you because you're committing blasphemy, because you're saying you and God are one. And Jesus answers them. It's in your law. That's going to be the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. And so Jesus at this point quotes Psalm 82, 6, where it says, and this is going to be confusing, I said, you are God's sons of the most high, all of you. What he's saying is you are not God's in the holy spiritual sense. You are representatives of God and you are called to be, in this case, people who tell the truth of God. And that's what I was always told was the definition of a prophet of God, someone who tells the truth to powerful people, to not powerful people, you need to hear the truth right now. I am the son of God. I get to properly be called this because I am much more deserving because I'm the son of God. I am one with the father. And you can't say Jesus is blaspheming because I can say these words about myself more than anyone can say about themselves. And you're saying it in Psalm 82, 6. This blaspheming part of it has to do with the fact that in 165 BC, Judas Maccabee beat the Greeks out of Jerusalem. They had sacked the nation. They had left a contingency to rule the area. That was what Alexander the Great did. Judas Maccabees, which I was fascinated with when I was a kid, beat them out of there. They didn't have enough light for the eternal flame inside the temple, but they only had enough for one day and it burned for eight days. And that is why it's the eight days of Hanukkah, Feast of Light. They celebrate this as the rededication of the temple away from the pagan gods, away from this horrible thing that happened to the temple building itself. We're rededicating this building, putting it back in the square of God. And what he's saying is you're calling about all this blasphemy. You're saying that you overcame these gods. You overcame these pagan gods. I am telling you, God the Father and I are the same people. You are not accusing me of blaspheming. You're not accusing me of calling myself a different God or even what Psalm 82, 6 is as a representative of God. I am one with God the Father. And the punishment for that crime would be stoning him. They were angry. They had been afraid all this time to reach out and strike against Jesus because they were afraid of the people, but they were so angry, they once again picked up stones to try to stone Jesus. And Jesus is telling them, you don't believe me. You don't believe the works. I am one with the Father. You should be believing in me, not stoning me, not throwing things away. Th this particular group, it says the Jews, but I think in these cases, it's going to be the temple structure. That's why I keep calling it that because there were many Jews that believed, like the apostles, 
believed in Jesus. It wasn't all of them. It was specific leadership people who saw their leadership on the wire. They knew that if people followed Jesus and John the Baptist, maybe their days of telling people what they should do and what they shouldn't do and forgiving their sins and getting paid for forgiving their sins and basically bossing everyone around, maybe he's coming to an end. And so I think this made them particularly mad because they saw their own power threatened. Like I said, I imagine if God came to Washington, D.C. and told them, you're not in power anymore. I'm the son of God. People would be mad. They're like, no, 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 I make the rules here. <laughs> you know, so I, you could see how angry it would be when people in power are threatened. And I think that's why they refuse to believe. The man who had no power, easy for him to believe because he had nothing. And he saw that God cared for the people who were considered nothing in society. These people had something to lose, which was their seat. They're walking through the temple with their robes and being all fancy-like. Says Jesus went back across the Jordan to a place where John was baptizing earlier. People came to him. People believed what John said was true. John couldn't do a sign. He's not God. But because of what John was saying, many people believed in Jesus. And that ends chapter 10. What I'm going to meditate on is how challenged people feel when their power is about to be taken from them. These should have been the very first people to believe in Jesus. They studied the scripture. They knew the word of God. They knew the prophecies of things to come. They should have gone, oh, yeah, that is the Messiah. But instead, they were so blinded, I think, by their own power by their own ability to, to be arrogant that they couldn't see Jesus. I hope we never get in that position where we're so blinded by our own power and strength that we don't understand. We're all God's sheep. We're all going through the gate together, whether you're the blind beggar, the high position Pharisee, or Nicodemus who comes in the middle of the night. The regular disciples, we're fishers of men. We're all going that same gate together. What I'm going to pray about is that I never have such an arrogance for my situation where I don't fall down at the feet of Jesus like the blind man and worship him. You are my good shepherd. I count on all my protection in this world on you. You know my name and I know your voice. And what I'm going to share with other people is that Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the one who puts his life down for the life of his sheep. He does not run away from the wolf. and. He is the one who is going to take us into the proper gate so that we may go in and out of the gate with Jesus and see no death. His gate leads to everlasting life. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe and tell a friend about this podcast. I hope you have a wonderful weekend.